Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. If you're a pet photographer ready to make more money and start living a life by your design, you've come to the right place. And now, your host, pet photographer, travel addict, chocolate martini connoisseur, Nicole Begley. Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. I'm Nicole Bagley, and today we have a special treat for you. Today's podcast is getting taken over by our friend Heather Lottinen, head coach for Elevate and also creator of Flourish Academy and a regular guest on the podcast. Well, if you haven't seen our previous two money makeover stories for our podcast, check out episodes number 95 and episode number 101, and then come listen to this one where Heather is going to be sharing her experience when a whole bunch of money trials and tribulations started popping up in her life in the past few weeks. You're going to love it. And as for me, I'll catch you next week. Have a great one. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Flourish Academy podcast. And in this episode, I'm going to walk you through a practical application of all of the principles we've been learning. My name is Heather Lottinen. I'm a photographer, educator, and entrepreneur. And I founded the Flourish Academy as a resource for photographers of all levels. We want to help you pursue your passion on your own terms because we believe there is room for everyone. In this podcast, we focus on creating breakthroughs with your mindset to discover the things that are really holding you back in business and life. As you learn all of the principles, strategies, and ideas that we talk about every week, I wonder, are you applying them to your life? And do you recognize or are you aware when something is happening in real time that you are utilizing something you've learned? I personally am keenly aware of this because I'm always, always looking for the lessons in everyday life, in normal situations and circumstances, because I I believe what good is all of this knowledge if you aren't applying it or trying to better yourself or your approach to life. Obviously, I try to interject what we are learning with stories to help solidify the concepts And that's what today is all about. I'm going to be sharing something that happened to me very recently because I feel that there are probably 55 lessons that I learned. Lessons around decision making, planning, managing emotional states, finances, budgeting, trusting my instincts, limiting beliefs, stories that I'm telling myself. I mean, really, the list goes on. And I'm sharing this today, not just to talk about myself, but because I know that it can help you. There are valuable lessons to be learned from my craziness. In order to lay the groundwork for the story, we have to go back to 2009. My kids were two and seven years old. We had paid off our home. We had zero debt. I was photographing upwards of 30 weddings a year, and we were in a really good spot. In early 2009, I was photographing a newborn session inside of the city of Pittsburgh and I hit a curb a little aggressively and my car had to be towed to the local dealership to be fixed. While my car was being serviced, I was sitting in the showroom of a Mercedes dealership and there was this beautiful car right in front of me. I looked at it. I looked at the price. I knew that we could afford it. I called my husband and I said, I have a flat tire. Can I buy a new car? (laughs) And he laughed and he said, sure, whatever, it was fine. And I was able to pay cash for that car. Now, before you freak out like, oh, a Mercedes, they're so expensive and you paid cash for that. That's crazy. It's a C-Class. The car was only $35,000. And I would assume that that urban assault vehicle that you call an SUV, the one you're driving, was probably more expensive than that. It's just that we had saved up money, so I was able to buy it with cash, which was amazing because I hate car payments. We don't like debt. We're Dave Ramsey fans. So I thought, I'm going to drive this car until she dies because it's a great car and why would I need a new one? Okay, fast forward. Here we are, 2021. The car is 11 years old, has 122,000 miles on it. And every time it goes in for service or inspection, I am quite nervous (laughs) because I know that at some point there are some repairs that are headed my way. I have adhered to the rigorous Mercedes maintenance plan, and she's been in really good condition for a very long time. 
well, I guess until now. I got the call last week. She was in for an inspection and I answered the phone. He says, this is the kind of call that I really hate to make. (laughs) I was like, what's with the dramatics? It's a car. And he said, well, in order to pass inspection, she needs $4,000 worth of work and an additional $4,100 to fix all of the issues that we found. So just over $8,000 worth of work. And I thought, well, here it is. I said, okay, thank you. I'm going to need a minute to process this. I got off the phone. I looked up how much the car is worth. Currently in good condition, in good healthy condition, that car is worth $5,100. Obviously, it does not make sense to fix it up and try to sell it for that amount. And here's where things took a turn south for me. I went into this emotional spiral of we don't have the money. I don't want to buy a new car. I like this car. I don't have time for this. I'm too busy. Just things started adding up on me really, really quickly. Now, in the, in the course of the last 11 years, we have saved money and put it aside for a car purchase because we like to pay cash. There is $23,000 sitting in that car account. However, we had anticipated that my husband's car would probably need to be replaced first. He drives an older Chevy Traverse. It has 135,000 miles on it, makes all kinds of strange noises. So we were planning on using that money for his car. We did not anticipate that mine would be the first to go. As a result, I didn't feel comfortable draining that account. I think $23,000 is probably enough to get a decent used car, which was my plan. But I didn't want to use all of that money in case he needs a car well, what am I going to do? Am I going to get some cheap car for $10,000 or less? And then I go into this whole, you know, the market is so crazy right now. Inventory is low on used cars because there's this chip shortage. So the new car, there aren't as many new cars. They're being ordered. They're sold before they hit the lot. That means the prices on the used cars are inflated. You're paying more than they're actually worth. It's just craziness. I don't want to deal with it. I usually give myself about 2.3 seconds to get over it. But I've got to tell you, it took me a little bit longer because I was in this spiral of, I don't want to spend the money. I don't have enough money. I'm never going to be able to find a car. I don't have time. What am I going to do? Oh, help me, Rhonda. But you have to take a step back for a moment and look at one of the core issues here. And that is, I didn't want to take out a loan on a car. And my husband said to me, What is wrong with putting $10,000 down on a car and taking out a small loan and paying it off quickly? What's the problem there? And at this point, I'm embarrassed to admit there were tears because I was just, well, I was just emotional. I don't know how else to say it. And I said, because car loans are for losers. That's what losers do. And I want to, okay, (laughs) relax. If you have a car loan, I'm not calling you a loser. I'm, I'm saying this is my limiting belief because I'm so hardcore Dave Ramsey that I can't take out a car loan because he yells at you all the time not to take out a car loan. So I had in my head that I was a failure. I was a failure if I had to take out a car loan because I should have been saving more money to pay cash for this car. I knew this day was coming. I'm not prepared, which is what makes me a loser. So do you see how that train of thought based on the belief that I couldn't take out a loan led to a shame spiral of me being a loser? By the way, when this was happening, I was catching it, but I felt really powerless to get myself out of this mode. Well, between my husband and my best friend, Nicole, they talked me down from this ledge. It's okay if you have to go find a used car and get a small loan, you can pay it off quickly. Like that is not the end of the world. Okay, good. Then I felt good about that. Oh, but then what happened next, I guess shouldn't surprise me. But you understand that every decision we make around finances is an emotional one because of how it makes us feel. The clothes you wear, the house you live in, the car you drive is all because your ego is seeking an emotional feeling. When I bought that Mercedes, it was 100% to have a status symbol to drive to weddings. I read the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, and he talked about first impressions, and I wanted to have a very nice looking car to show up at weddings. And it served me very well. (laughs) What I should say is it served my ego. It inflated my ego because this is a luxury car. It looks so fancy. 
You elevate yourself by driving something like that. And my ego was having a moment thinking about giving up that status symbol. It resisted so much that it forced me. (laughs) I know this is hilarious. My ego forced me to call the salesman at Mercedes and ask if there were any used ones on the lot for $20,000 or less. I had set my budget now at $20,000, the car to be $20,000 or less. Did they have a used one on the lot? And I, because I know they have in the past, but they're older models, of course. And he said, no, our inventory is low due to, ah, I said, stop, stop. I don't want to hear due to COVID. I don't want to hear it. I understand, but I need a car. He said, no, I'm sorry. We don't have anything. Okay. Well, you know, the truth is the cost of ownership on that car is ridiculous. It takes premium gas. When you have to buy new tires, you have to buy four because they're different sizes. You can't rotate them. New tires on the Mercedes are about $1,200 for the set. All of the maintenance is very expensive. Cost of ownership is high. And it just doesn't make any practical sense for me to get another one. It was great in that season of life, and I'm glad it lasted as long as it did, but it doesn't make sense moving forward. And I really (laughs) had a, a bit of a hard time coming to terms with that because I'm used to this fancy luxury car. I know that that is 100% from my ego and not from my rational brain. But the ego is very powerful and does a really good job at trying to ratchet up your emotional state, which is what was happening. Okay, but a few hours later, we went to bed that evening and I was like, okay, I have a plan. I am going to look online for a used car and I need to get this taken care of ASAP because I absolutely cannot tolerate loose ends. I think loose ends are really distracting, which is why one of the things I talk about all the time in my coaching and in Elevate is I'll say to people, what's the monkey on your back? What do you need to take care of that you've been procrastinating on because it's holding you back more than you realize? I know this and I apply it in my life. So I'm like, I'm going to get this taken care of straight away. Well, at one point I was waiting to hear back from the salesman at Mercedes and he had Thursday off. Okay, th- these time frames are important. I got this news Tuesday evening. I talked to the salesman on Wednesday. He was going to look around for me. He had Thursday off. So I knew that on Friday I was going to talk to him. In the meantime, the service manager had called me back Thursday afternoon asking what I'd like to do with the car. And I said, you know what, I'll, I'll come pick it up. I, they had given me a loaner. I will take the loaner, but by the way, smart move, Mercedes. When they come pick up your car, they leave you a loaner and it's always a brand new model that is all decked out. The one that they left me last week was more like a rocket ship than a car. It was so fancy, I didn't even know how to turn it on. So anyway, because they're trying to sell you a nicer car, I get it, smart. I take the car back. Friday morning, I decide I I have to get my car back and try to figure out if I'm going to go to a dealer and try to trade it in or if I'm going to sell it outright and then use that money to buy a car. So I get to the dealership and the service manager is really nice. And he's like, I'm so sorry I had to make that phone call. And I said, I understand. She was on hospice. She's having a lot of trouble. And you know, all of the usual niceties. And then he says, how are you getting home? Uh, I said, I'm sorry. I am what? I'm driving my car home. He said, "Um, what road are you taking? Which way do you go? And I was explaining. He said, okay, I just don't want you to get on the highway. I said, really? Why is that? He said, the rear subframe of your car is completely rotted. It has rusted out. It is not currently attached to your vehicle. It is being held in place by a piece of plastic. And I just want you to be safe. And I thought, okay, so it's not safe to drive my car. Like this is this is not good, first of all, (laughs) but I also don't have a lot of time to mess around in terms of selling it privately or taking it to a dealership because it's going to fall apart or I'm going to get in an accident and then it's going to be worth zero dollars. So I said, okay, thank you. I got on my phone and I looked up the closest Subaru dealership. Now I decided I wanted a Subaru because we live in the middle of the woods in Western Pennsylvania up a mountain and it is a requirement to have an all wheel drive vehicle that goes really, really really well in snow. So I drove 2.8 miles from the Mercedes dealership to the Subaru dealership. And I walked up to a salesman and I said, hi, my name is Heather. I need a car. 
And he said, okay. I explained, I'd like to have somebody look at my Mercedes, tell me what they could give me. And I'm looking for something I used either a Crosstrek or maybe an Impreza, probably in the 2017, 2018 range for $20,000 or less. And then what I said next, let, let me back up. The night before, in my mind, there's something I practice in terms of my values. I've talked about this in the past, and that is if you know who you are, what you want, what you believe in, all of your decisions are made before you encounter them. I am a very decisive person because my decisions are made before I encounter them. The night before I went to pick up my car, I thought to myself, what is a requirement for a car? I want a used car that goes well in the snow for $20,000 or less. Those are my requirements. And then I thought to myself, bonus points. If it's a white car with tan interior and a manual transmission, because I really miss driving a stick shift. But I also knew that I couldn't be picky because, you know, inventory is limited. Okay, so I'm at the Subaru dealership and I say to the salesman, white exterior with a tan interior and a manual transmission would be like off the charts for me. That would be the most amazing thing ever. But I understand that I cannot be particular at this point. And he looked at me and he said, you know what? This is kind of a fluke, but there was a car that just came in. Let me just check and make sure it's here before I say anything. And he walked away and he came back and he said, let me show you. And he walked out to show me a white car with a tan interior and a manual transmission. (laughs) And I almost fell over dead. There was only one thing about it that I was like, oh, I don't know. It was brand new. I didn't want to buy brand new. I wanted to buy something used because new cars lose their value really quickly. Of course, everyone knows that. And I just wasn't into it. I had determined I wanted a used car. He said someone ordered this car. They came in and their financing didn't go through. So here it is. It's only been here for a day or two. And I said, wow, well, I really didn't want a new car. And then my eyes scanned over to the price. You guys, the price on this car was $20,000. Brand new $20,000 car that met all of my requirements. In my mind, I was like, check, we're done here. Let's go process the paperwork. I don't care how much you're giving me for the old girl. This is done. This is amazing. Now, side note, one of the reasons someone like Dave Ramsey doesn't recommend buying a new car is because they lose their value. And if you finance the entire thing and you drive off the lot, you are automatically upside down in that car, meaning you owe more than it's worth. Well, I knew I was going to be putting $10,000 or more down with the trade-in, so that wouldn't happen, even though I really was looking at a used car. So in my mind, this was a done deal, but obviously I thought, well, I should probably drive it. So I took it for a test drive. And even though I haven't driven a manual in about 20 years, it was like riding a bike and I loved it. Got out of the car and I said, you know what, I'm just going to walk around the lot just to feel good about this decision and make sure there aren't any used cars I should be checking out. I found a couple of used cross trucks that had 44,000 miles um, approximately each and were listed between 25 and $26,000. So and that's because they had premium packages. And I thought to myself, I could pay more for a used car, but you have to trust your instinct in your decisions. The night before, I had said to myself, white, tan, manual, all-wheel drive, under 20, done. And there it was, literally right in front of me. I don't even know why I hesitated for a second. I really didn't. I just thought, I'll look around and I'll move forward. Okay, there was, <laughs> there was one slight hesitation. He said to me, you're coming from that Mercedes to this car. You understand it's a base model. It does not have power seats. It does not have heated seats. It doesn't have any of the luxury items that you are used to in your car. And I took a deep breath and I thought to myself, the only reason I would resist this is because of my ego and how it makes me feel in terms of a status symbol. I am working to overcome my ego. So I said, no, those things don't bother me. And he told me we could add heated seats if I wanted to. So that's fine. But manual seats? No, who cares? I drive it. It's going to stay in the same place. Well, he sends my car in to be looked at. And then he leans forward really serious, really serious. And he points down at the tires and he says, are you going to be okay with hubcaps? (laughs) 
because it doesn't have the fancy wheels like a Mercedes. I said, bro, I do not even care about the wheels. No, that's fine. It's all wheel drive. It goes in the snow. I'm pretty happy. This is a very practical decision. We went in, we wrote everything up. They looked at my car and they said, well, it needs a lot of work. And I was like, no kidding. The rear end is about to fall off. Um, We can give you 3,500. I said, done, I'll take it. I walked out of that dealership, $18,000, 10 in cash, a little over in eight in a car loan that I plan to have paid off probably in the next few months. So many lessons here. And I was able to leave some cash in our account should Craig's car suffer the same ending. (laughs) Maybe he will need a new one. I don't know, but the money is there. As we were writing up the deal, he, he was trying to ask me, but he was trying to be really politically correct. He was trying to say, do you want your husband to come in and sign this with you? But I think he knew better than to say that because I'm incredibly independent and I absolutely have something to prove. My Mercedes was in my own name. This car is in my own name. And I said, no, I'm going to take care of this myself. I do recognize that when you are self-employed, financing can look a little bit different because they question everything. But my business has been around long enough, is stable enough, and has the income to support the car that I'm purchasing. So it was not an issue. In fact, he came back Him and the finance guy both said, I've never seen a credit score that high. And I said, well, I pay my bills. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I filled everything out and off I went in my brand new Subaru Impreza. It's a 2022. It's so pretty. But yes, it is a base model car. And I was used to luxury. Oh, humbling. Yes, this is good for me. But I'll tell you what, I feel great about the decision because I know that I made the right one. I'm trusting my instinct. I feel good about it. I am unnaturally excited about the fact that I do not have to put premium gas in that car. And it's a manual transition. I'm zipping around this town with more fun than I've had in a car in a long time. And I can't wait to teach my children how to drive a real car. But one of the really important lessons I learned, there were so many, but one was that I didn't realize how much That car, my old car, was weighing on my shoulders. I was constantly worried about it. I was a little bit resentful of all of the money that had to go into it, including the premium gas. I knew it was on its last days, which meant I was going to have to do something at some point anyway. There's only one word I can use to describe what I'm feeling right now, and it is just complete relief. I feel relieved to have that monkey off my back, to have it taken care of. I'm driving a car that is practical and reliable and will get me around in the snow. I'll have that loan paid off in no time. And hopefully Craig's car sticks around for a little bit longer. But if it doesn't, I know that we can survive because taking out a small loan on a car is not, in fact, the worst thing in the world. (laughs) And I, I recognize that it doesn't mean I failed or that I'm a loser. And I used to say things like, I'll never buy a new car. I'll only ever pay cash. And here I am doing what I said I wouldn't do. But you have to be flexible in your decision making and you have to trust yourself. I trust myself that I purchased a car that is well within my range of affordability and that I'll have it paid off quickly and it won't be an issue. I think the issue or the problem is when people get in over their heads and they purchase a car that they really can't afford. And as I was getting in my new car to drive off the lot, the salesman ran over at the last minute and he said, you see that guy standing there? I said, yeah. He said, he came to buy that car. And I just smiled and I thought, well, I said, well, tell him I'm sorry, but that car was meant to be mine. It was just I wish you could have been there to see my expression when I walked over to this white car with a tan interior, a manual transmission at 20K. I, it just was unbelievable to me. I hope that you found this story useful, valuable, inspiring. But really, I just want you to take all of the concepts, the strategies, the tools that we're learning together as we read these books and apply them to your own life. I'd love if you could leave a comment and let me know something you've done recently that you have been aware of or found helpful based on the strategies that we've learned. 
If you enjoyed this podcast episode, go ahead and take a screenshot of this episode on your phone and post it up there on your Instagram stories and be sure to tag us at Hair of the Dog Academy. And we would just love to see how you're listening. And uh, full disclosure, sometimes we just like to give away a little pet photographer swag in the form of Hair of the Dog t-shirts and sweatshirts. So what are you waiting for? Go ahead and share that screenshot of this episode. And don't forget to tag us at Hair of the Dog Academy. And while you're there, maybe you want to jump on over to our account and see what we're up to on the gram. Would love to connect with you. Thanks for listening to the Hair of the Dog podcast. If you want to check out the show notes for access to any of the links that we shared in this episode, as well as any additional related resources, simply go to www.hairofthedogacademy.com slash 103. Thanks for listening to this episode of Hair of the Dog podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please take a minute to leave a review. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our upcoming episodes. One last thing. If you are ready to dive into more resources, head over to our website at www.hairofthedogacademy.com. Thanks for being a part of this pet photography community.